Hello folks, this is Tom from anti-proton.com and I want to start out by saying a couple things. This is going to be lengthy, but this is the answer to many different emails that I've gotten that are all basically the same thing. Different different questions, different sort of, sort of bits, but they're all about the same sort of subject. And so I kind of want to wrap them all up together. So just to let you know, if you're one of those people that was wanting to know, like, what is cosmic background radiation? Um, how much is actually hitting me compared to what I detect? Um, also, if you want to get into decays, what is a nuclear decay? What's the difference between alpha and beta? When do they happen? That sort of thing. What are gamma rays? How do they relate to x-rays? That's what I'm going to get into. This is going to be a long, lengthy thing. I try to come up with all these various ways to show it, little models and demonstrations, but it just, when it all boils down, the best way to, for me to explain the whole thing is just to sit here and tell you. Or you could go to your local university and take a nuclear physics uh, uh, class. God, that doesn't that sound like that would be way more fun, though? I, I'd love that. I'm going to go back and get my degree in physics anyway. My computer degree is all neat and everything, but I want, I want a physics degree. It's way more fun. But anyway, <clears throat> so I'm going to get into that. And I have some notes down here, so you'll see my eyes will shift down. It's because I'm looking at my notes because I mix stuff up all the time if I don't have some notes for myself. And I have some notes that are up there, so you'll see me doing that. And you'll see me scratching my nose a lot, too. Because it's been itching me all day. I'm not picking my nose. I'm scratching my nose because it freaking itches. Drive me absolutely nuts. Okay, one or two quick announcements, then on to the yakking. And sorry, this is a yakking video. Yeah, I know I show neat stuff sometimes. Sometimes I just yak. Okay, announcement one. I'm headed to Ruggles Mine, New Hampshire, which is a uranium mine. It's open to the public. You can go there. It's not for picking uranium. It's just a, there's all kinds of other minerals to get. And I've been there once before. But uh, you can also get uranium there, and especially if you happen to have a nice good detector with you too and i'll be going let me look at my little calendar here i'll be leaving on the sunday the 4th of august and i'll be getting back wednesday the 7th of august so around the 4th the 5th and the 6th of august i'll be at ruggles mine so if you're at ruggles mine new hampshire you'll probably bump into me um i'll be get, going there to um uh, find specimens if i can and I'll take videos, and if it all boils down to it, I can't find any specimens, for the love of God, at least I'll hit the rock shop. I'm sure they have one, and I'll probably blow a couple hundred bucks on some specimens, because that's what I do. Anyway, so, <clears throat> uh, other announcements that I was going to make. Oh, um, one other announcement. Somebody posted something on the internet showing a picture of RadiationNetwork.com, and purporting to have removed from it all of the stations that had low count rate Geiger counters, um, that's fine. I, first off, I don't own RadiationNetwork.com. I'm just a member of it. I have no affiliation with that. I just, other than the fact that I'm a member, I mean, I, I mean I'm a member. Um, and if somebody wants to post the picture and remove stuff, that's between them and RadiationNetwork.com. Don't care about it. The thing that bothered me, though, is they explicitly used my station's name, and they said Antiprotons is an example of a station that purposefully uses a low count rate Geiger counter, like a, they said a Rat Alert 100, but I actually have a CRM 100. They're basically the same thing, though, I guess. Um, and the, the connotation was that the purpose of me doing that was to make everything seem safer and lower than it really is, which anybody who knows the damn thing about Geiger counters knows that the count rate doesn't say whether or not it's safe or not. What's, what a Geiger counter does is it shows you change in rate, not the count rate. So if I have 10,000 counts per minute background and I go up, to 11,000, that's about the same as if I had 100 count, counts per minute background and went up to 110. It's not the gross counts, it's the change in the counts. My God, I swear. But anyway, whoever did that, um, I just want to let them know that they probably, I don't know, it's a sad you put that out there. You know, nothing I can do about it. I don't really care that much. It's, just, it's, it's silly because it's, doesn't, it's not actually accurate. It's like remotely, it's terrible. I don't know. So, uh, enough of ranting. Um, Let's get into it. We're going to start with uh, uh, what is in our background, cosmic background and everything, and then we're going to get into decays. First off, cosmic background. Everything I am about to say, if anybody gets all whiny about it, I can send you links to, like, for example, some of my stuff. I mean, I, I know this, but I'm getting a lot of, I went and double-checked everything against known cited sources and stuff first so that when somebody comes back and says, I don't believe what you're saying, it's completely fake. You're not a physicist. You're right, I'm not a physicist. I don't even play one on TV. But um, I didn't even stay at Holiday Inn Resort last night. But uh, I'm looking up here directly at NASA's website. 
Now, I already know what I'm about to read from NASA's website, but it's from NASA's website. And unlike me, they actually do have physicists, billions of them, well, dozens of hundreds of thousands. So you get the idea. I'm backing my work up that way, even though I already know it anyway, but, you know, everybody's so obnoxious about stuff. So um, <clears throat> first off, what is cosmic background? The sun is emitting radiation that's hitting us. When I say radiation, from now on, I'm referring to ionizing radiation. That is radiation that has the power to knock electrons out of orbit and make atoms become ionized. They don't bond together the way they used to. They stick to other stuff. I'm not talking about radiation from your cell phone, which is radiation, but it's lower energy radiation. It's not ionizing. Not the same thing. I'm not trying to say it's safe or anything. I'm not making any qualifications of safety. Another thing, for the whole video, I'm not talking about safety in any way, shape, or form. I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying it's not. If I say lower energy, it doesn't mean less dangerous or anything. I'm just saying lower energy. Okay, so cell phone radiation, microwave radiation, visible light radiation, thermal heat radiation, you know, infrared, ultraviolet, all that stuff is nice and everything and has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. I'm talking about x-rays and gamma rays and that sort of stuff, you know, the powerful stuff. Okay, now, the Earth is getting bombarded all the time from galactic radiation. These are particles of flying from all over space, uh, sometimes called, co called cosmic rays. And it gets hit by uh, radiation from the sun and all kinds of other stuff, all kinds of other stuff. Uh, first off, gamma rays, uh, cosmic rays. The term ray should not be used. It's a historical term. It's actually not very accurate because these aren't like a beam. That's what you think of when you think of ray, a beam. That's what. So I think it's what they more or less thought back then. They're actually individual, individual little particles, an individual little thing. Well, it's not like a physical object. When you get to matter at that rate, it starts to become more like a wave form of probabilities. And blah, blah, blah. But it's effectively a thing. It's quantifiable, hence quantum mechanics. It is quantifiable. It's not exactly what quantum mechanics means, but close enough. Um, and I know this already, but I'm going to read it reasonably verbatim and under fair use from NASA's website. Wait a minute. NASA's public domain anyway because they're government. Yeah, that's right. I think. Anyway, whatever. Sue me. Uh, but 90% of cosmic rays let me say this using different words so that I'm not directly quoting them. Okay. Cosmic rays are about 90% protons, which they call hydrogen nuclei. I've always not really been happy with that because a proton by itself is in hydrogen nuclei, but it might not necessarily be a hydrogen <laughs> Anyway, so uh, protons are about 9 out of 10 of the particles hitting us. And they come and they fly and slam into the atmosphere and the Van Allen radiation belts like a cool shield around the Earth that's like deflecting them and everything. Um, uh, about 9% of them are Helium nuclei, which would be again alpha particles, you know, two protons, two neutrons stuck together like four little ball things and they fly at you really, really fast. Remember, polonium 210 emits alpha particles. Helium floating about is alpha particles, except not really. It's the same thing, it's just not moving very fast. So about 9% of them are going to be that. And the last remaining 1% of them, according to this, Make, is made up of other rare elements and so on. I'd like to point out that there should also be gamma rays involved in there too, but you know, whatever, nobody asked me. So that's that, that the gamma ray parts on the side, that's for me saying that, so I think that's correct. Okay, so uh, that's what's hitting us. When these protons slam into the atmosphere, these heavier nuclei, like a, a carbon atoms and stuff, and I should point out these, uh, these atoms that are slamming into the atmosphere, they usually don't have electrons around them. They're like the atom without the electrons. Electrons have been stripped off long ago. Long ago, as they flew through space, electrons got stripped off. So you have just the nucleus left flying along. And when they slam into the atmosphere, they hit other particles and they deflect, like a billiard ball. If you have a billiard ball sitting here by itself, and another billiard ball goes by, it deflects. And most of the energy of the one hitting it, unless it hits it directly on, most of the energy of the billiard ball will be retained, and it will bounce off at an angle, and this ball will move just a little bit. That's kind of how it happens in the atmosphere. And when it hits, it'll, it, it can do all kinds of things. I mean, you would not believe the lists and numbers of possible things you can get. Oftentimes you get fragments. Little particles get generated. It's called fragmentation or spallation. And uh, you'll get showers. Sometimes a particle will hit bam, straight on and just kind of, it doesn't explode, that's not really the right way to say it, but it kind of breaks apart into energy, and of course energy doesn't exist as just energy, it becomes mass. E equals mc squared, energy equals mass times speed light squared. And that energy has to become something, because you can't, it can't go anywhere, it can't do anything, it has to, it has to be something, and it will become, um, if it's not going to be something, it's going to be a photon, if nothing more, but it, it typically becomes stuff. It'll become muon particles. It'll become various leptons, like, uh, well, muon is a lepton. Uh, electrons, it'll become anti-electrons. It'll be uh, uh, all kinds of things. And these things will shower and rain down upon us. 
from from space. They hit us all the time, and this stuff's always hitting us. It's been hitting us since the dawn of time. And in fact, since uh, evolution, which is the accepted uh, theory for uh, species for things like speciation and stuff, since that 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 requires some uh, random mutation to occur, although keep in mind evolution itself is not random, but random mutation is required. It's one of the required me mechanisms for it. It is very likely that a lot of that random mutation came as a result of genetic damage from cosmic radiation. So, hey, thanks, cosmic radiation. Um, cosmic radiation is hitting us all the time. That's what Geiger counters and things detect. Like the Geiger counter here is getting a pretty potent background. A lot of what you're hearing, a lot of that's from space. And you're not hearing, you're not hearing the direct particles. You're not hearing the direct particles hitting the detector from space typically. Sometimes they do, but usually not. Usually what's happening is they're hitting other things and ricocheting off and emitting lesser energy particles, which these things detect. And the reason is these powerful particles are so energetic, they're not even able to be detected. Often they just skip right on through the um, uh, detector without ever even touching it. It's almost transparent to them. Um, so that's kind of an explanation of that. Now I'll get into gamma ray bursts in just a second. Uh, so, you, you're also going to be picking up a lot of radiation from the ground. I'll explain that also in a minute, too. So, that, that's kind of what cosmic radiation is. Now, gamma ray bursts, you hear about that sometimes. People say, oh, it's a gamma ray burst, we'll all die. A gamma ray burst could be powerful enough to basically sterilize the planet. It's possible. It's not very likely from our sun, um, but it's possible, you know, from a powerful enough burst in space. In fact, cosmic rays could theoretically do that, but it would take ridiculous amounts of energy. Uh, gamma ray bursts usually occur from things like the sun. What happens is the sun kind of snaps like that and pops a little bit of plasma out, you know, and it shoots a bunch of gamma rays out, highly energetic photons. Now, let me explain what a gamma ray and an x-ray are just quickly. I'll go into detail in a minute. But a gamma ray and an x-ray are the same thing. They're both photons, just like light. The light you see bouncing off of my skin going back to your camera lens that you are then seeing. That is nothing more than a photon. It's a little particle a particle of energy, a little quantum of energy, a little little bitty, bitty bit of energy. And a photon has a little chunk of energy to it and it has a wavelength. And its energy is inversely proportionate to its wavelength. To make that simple, the, the bigger the wavelength, remember wavelength? The bigger wavelength between the peaks and the trough, the wider it is, the lower energy it is. But as it becomes tighter together, like this, it gets higher and higher energy and it just tears right through stuff. So pho photons that have super duper high energy are uh, uh, gamma rays and x-rays. And there's actually a further difference between them, which I'll explain in a few minutes. Just to let you know something that a lot of people aren't aware of, visible light is actually very high in energy. It really is. Actually, it's higher in energy than microwaves. Yeah, microwaves may cause cancer. I'm not going to get into whether they do or don't. Oh, please, God, don't get me in one of those idiotic debates as to whether they do or they don't. I don't know. And for that matter, I'm not sure science knows either. But it is an interesting fact that microwaves are actually low in, lower in energy than visible light is. This visible light we're getting hit with is a pretty potent in energy, believe it or not. Now, all that stuff comes flying out. A gamma ray burst is a burst of coherent gamma rays that shoot from the sun, or technically other places in space can emit them too. There are lots of other little planets, I mean um, stars, and they slam into the Earth with a lot of power, and they just kind of blanket us. And sometimes your, your Geiger counters and gamma ray uh, detectors and stuff can actually detect them. The problem is that they all come at the same time, and only one or two of those little gamma rays are going to get detected by the Geiger counters. So how the heck do you know what's what? That's why you need really powerful detectors and collimators and stuff like that to actually figure out what they are. I think I may have actually detected one once. If you go to my website, I'll put a link to it. I actually ex show my experimental data, and you can look at it and be like, he's right, he did detect one, or he has not the slightest idea what he's talking about, and he's smoking something, blah, blah, blah. So you look at that and figure it out for yourself. Let the data speak for itself. Okay, <clears throat> so this is what we're detecting. Mostly not gamma ray burst. We're detecting mostly uh, uh, cosmic coming from space. And we're also detecting a lot of radiation from the ground, which I'll get into in a second. Um, I should point out that also there are other uh, uh, emission sources for uh, um, photons and things. For example, lightning. Apparently when lightning strikes and it's up in the clouds shooting around, it can actually shoot little, little whippity little bursts of... Um, uh, 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 photons at us from various directions, and those can actually be detected with things like Geiger counters sometimes. By the way, the trademark of picking these things up is not going to be your Geiger counter needle spazzing for a long time, because it isn't. It's almost immediate. It would just be kind of a major zzz, suddenly, like that. The problem is, of course, is that uh, it's really hard to distinguish that from just random happenstance of a bunch of particles hitting the detector at the same time. And then you want to use something called coincidence to figure it out. But anyway, and the next thing to consider for background, because the question, initial question was about background radiation, is the actual background itself, all the little rocks and minerals and stuff that make up your uh, background. Um, on the ground, um, every single 
every single cubic uh, uh, cubic uh, um, uh, let's say meter of soil is going to contain a little bit of uranium, a little bit of thorium, a little bit of potassium, and some other stuff. Now, some will have tiny, 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 almost undetectable bits. Some will have lots of it, depending on where you are. There are beaches in Brazil, for example, where the radioactivity is so high. Well, if you ever looked at BioNerd23, her videos, she has one of these guys right here freaking pegged, like needle hard over um, from how radioactive the beach sand is over there. And it's natural. Oh, my God. God makes Fukushima look like a uh, like a vacation spot by comparison. Eh, maybe not. Depends where you are in Fukushima. If you're near the reactor, it's nothing's a vacation spot. That's enough to kill you. But anyway, um, but other places on Earth are not too bad at all. So you get a mix of both above and bottom. And if you remember my video I did where I took my gamma spectrometer up in the airplane with me, you'll notice that there was a clear point at which the radioactivity that I was detecting dropped as, uh, as the airplane went up because I was moving away from all the stuff coming from the ground. And then it started to increase again as I got back up high where the, where the higher energy particles were hitting me. So there's both of them hitting us all of the time. Now one of the questions that was asked is, okay, fine, I get 100 counts per minute on a Geiger counter, you get 1,000. What's the real dose Right. What is how much is really there? Well, to give you an idea, down here on the ground, we're picking up a lot of gamma rays. Uh, depending on where you are in altitude, you pick up different types of particles. It's just it's like going in the ocean, different fish, different places. Uh, really high up, you're going to get more protons and muons and that sort of thing. Down here on the ground, we're going to get a lot, lot more um, uh, energetic, uh, you know, uh, photons. Basically, X rays, gamma rays. Um, that'll be a lot of our background because uh, alphas, alpha particles, you get a lot of alpha particle radiation really close to stuff. Like right on the ground, for the first inch or two off the ground, you'll pick up alphas. But away from that, you don't get them because they don't, they can't make it farther than that. They, they dissipate too quickly. Um, and beta is the same way. They don't go too far. Another foot or two away from the ground, they're, they're gone. So for the most part, some, some can go for a long distance, but usually not. So mostly what we're picking up right here, you know, few feet above the ground in this kind of area. Most of that's going to be gamma rays. Now, for, for, for gamma rays, this thing has a different efficiency for picking them up. And efficiency means the probability that it will detect them. Uh, let's say if, if 10 gamma rays hit it, but it only detects two of them, it has a 20% efficiency for detecting gamma rays of that energy. As energy goes up, the efficiency usually goes down. Okay, overall, for the most common gamma rays that I detect with this thing, from about 10 or 15 kilo electron volts of energy up to about maybe one, one and a half million electron volts, this thing's average efficiency is somewhere between 5 and 7%. So that means 5 to 7 out of 100 gamma rays. That's 5%. Now, we could get all like really hardcore science about that and say, okay, well, wait a minute, there's a lot of higher energy ones. Are you taking them into account? No, I'm not. But what I'm trying to say is that 2,000, at 2,000 counts per minute, let me get that up again for you. At 2,000 counts per minute, that's a lot of background. Um, let me shut the sound off on that. And to give you an idea, let's just do the math. What? Let's say I take 5% of it. I'll take the low ball estimate. Let's say 2,000 counts per minute is my background divided by 0 0.05. That would mean 40,000 uh, gamma rays are going through it per minute. That would be 600, 666. <laughs> uh, funny number. 666.66, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, lots of numbers. So 666 gamma rays per second are going through the detector and we're only picking up a few of them okay now that's kind of ballpark the answer is I can't really answer that question exactly because it gets really complicated and it's tremendous amounts to do with where you are at any given time what kind of how much radioactivity you're picking up and then there's also weirder aspects to it like for example those muons I told you about that are created as the result of high energy particles hitting the atmosphere those muons actually don't live long enough to make it to the ground but here's the weird thing they're moving so close to the speed of light that they actually experience time dilation. Time slows down for them. And they actually are able to make it to the ground because time is moving slower for them than it is for us. <laughs> How's that for special? So the world of all of this is very, very strange and very, very confusing. And it's actually way more complicated than it is to, than you could possibly imagine to try to answer it. But for the most part, in a nutshell, and then I'll move on to the next part of the video. So in a nutshell, from the ground, on the ground, we're picking up betas, alphas, gammas, and x-rays. 
a few inches above the ground, we're picking up more and more gammas and x-rays and less, well, not more and more, but you're, you're going to have more and more of just gammas and x-rays and less and less of the alpha and betas. Basically, the gamma and x-ray level stays about the same, but the, but the alpha and beta drops down as you get away from the ground. As you're going higher and higher up, the gammas and x-rays start to diminish above coming from the ground, and you start picking up lots and lots more from space. And as you go higher and higher, you pick up more and more and more from space until all you're picking up is what's coming from space. The stuff coming from the ground is, is going to be thorium, uranium, uh, potassium, and their decay daughters. They have lots of decay daughters. That's the most of what you're getting. Depends where you're I mean, if you're in Chernobyl or Fukushima, you're probably picking up mostly cesium-137 from the accident. But if you're like over here where I live, you're... Probably not. You might actually pick up a little bit, but not very much. When you get up into space, or rather just higher in the atmosphere, top of Mount Everest and higher, um, you're going to be picking up um, uh, protons and muons and every freaking particle you can ever imagine. And all these weird particles are being built and created as, as, as high energy protons hit the atmosphere and split apart. Spallation, if you like, okay, fragmentation. So that's kind of the background of what you're getting, and that explains everything, hopefully. The reason Geiger counters uh, get a uh, much more linear change in, in count with respect to altitude is because they're so much better at picking up really high energy, huge, wide um, ranges of particles. They don't discriminate. Things like my scintillator over here discriminate and specifically look for a narrow particular range, which is really useful, but it means that they have these weird like dead zones they'll go into sometimes as you're going up and down unless you configure them. So, do you put that simply put? To put that simply put, this poor English. Yeah, oh wow, that's how low that is. A Geiger counter gets a very, very low background, and a scintillator gets a really high background, but they're both reading the same background, they're just reading different levels of the same background. Wow, that gets a really low background. Put it against the check source. I heard a tick. Hold on. Open the check source up. Are you working? Okay, it's working. It's just that low. Welcome to not sensitive. I think my problem is I'm so used to the scintillator now that I don't even remember how Geiger counters work. <laughs> yeah. Sensitive. So anyway, now to get into the next part of this video. The next part of the video was an explanation of ionization itself. And uh, not ionization, I'm sorry. An explanation of decays, like gammas and alphas and all this stuff. And how do I, how do I like lift this up and be like, well, oh, it's mostly beta decay, but there's going to be some isolated America uh, adjustments going on, some gamma rays. How do we know all that stuff? What does it mean? Blah, 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 blah. So let's get into it, okay? Deep breath. Okay. First off, what the heck is a decay? Particles are made of matter and energy, right? Rather, when you start to look at it, energy and matter start to get a little more confusing. The closer that you look under the microscope at them, you don't look in a microscope, you know what I mean? Uh, the, figuratively speaking, the closer you look at them, the less the energy and matter seem to be different. It seems almost like matter becomes more like energy in a quantifiably coherent state. Let's see if any physicists send me hate mail for that one. But basically put, think of matter as being like a plucked violin string that vibrates, right? That's more or less what matter sort of is. And it vibrates with various uh, characteristics. That's kind of an interesting way to put it. Um, various configurations. And there's so many different uh, things. There's, uh, 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 let's see, there are, um, there's, there's angular intrinsic momentum, there's orbital momentum, uh, there's um, electrical charge, uh, there's quantum chromodynamic binding energy between various types of, uh, we have strong energy interactions, and weak energy interactions, all these properties that exist. So just consider these to be various attributes of these little vibrating bits of matter. Think of it like a thick uh, violin string versus a thin violin string versus one that's thick on this end but thin on this end or thin on this end and thick on this end. They have various properties, okay? And so when these vibrations and properties are, are, are affected differently by different things and certain... whenever matter finds a, a less energetic state it can be in, a net calmer state, it tries to jump down to that state if it can. It's kind of like it always wants to slow down if it can, it wants to calm down if it can, and if it can't, it can't, but if it can, it will, usually. 
And decay occurs when a, a, a bit of matter, if you like, some sort of matter, figures out that it, I shouldn't say figures out, I make it seem like it has some kind of intelligence. It doesn't have intelligence, it's a probabilistic thing. It, its, state, its state will probabilistically jump to a lower, calmer state, if you like, and it does this uh, whenever it can. Now, whenever an atom changes from one state to another state that's lower in energy, that extra energy, the lost energy, whatever the difference between the two was, that energy has got to go somewhere because energy cannot be created and not, cannot be destroyed. The energy that, that came out of, the, out of the state transfer from this to this, the dropping in energy, that wasn't created. It was left over, surplus, from when it dropped down. So it wasn't created. It was just let go of. It was emitted. And something has to happen to energy. And remember that energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. Mass equals um, uh, energy divided by the speed of light squared. So basically put, um, this is mass energy equivalence. Um, energy has to do something. And sometimes it, it can perfectly turn itself into another particle like an electron and go zooming off. Sometimes it shoots off as just a photon of some varying various wavelength. And these, uh, the, the, the change in state is the actual decay. Okay, the decay product of the decay emission is the thing that came out of it, the, the energy that shoots out of it. And you have primary decays. That's when um, uh, L, uh, atom A, or particle A, rather, I should say particle. Particle A decays to particle B and emits energy. And that's a primary decay. The secondary is when A decays to B. And then as the result of that, afterwards, to calm down kind of subsequently, but without actually changing what it is, emits a particle or a photon or whatnot. So that's kind of the difference between the two. The whole point is to calm down. That's the whole point, all right? Now, uh, primary decays are beta and cluster, typically. You're like, beta and cluster? What are you talking about? Okay, beta decay, you've probably heard of before. There's my nose itching again. Beta decays, like beta radiation. You've heard of beta radiation. I'll go into what that is in a minute. But those are beta radiation. That, that's beta decays. That's when you have uh, little electrons flying off. That is like the simplest explanation. Or if I'm going to explain more detail, like what I actually mean by that. But... We'll call it electrons flying off. It's actually much more complicated than that. But uh, the second type is cluster decays. And a cluster decay is when the nucleus of an atom, remember the nucleus of an atom is made of protons and neutrons, a bunch of them, when part of that breaks off and goes flying somewhere. And uh, when that flies off somewhere, you, that's a cluster, clustered bit of nucleons, the parts that make up the inside of the atom in the nucleus. A clustered bit of them shoots off. It's called a cluster decay. The most famous and common cluster decay by far, of course, is the alpha particle. So alpha radiation is what most people would say, beta and alpha. I say beta and cluster because technically there's other types besides alpha. Okay, secondary emissions, things that happen as a result of that, but without changing anything per se, are going to be x-rays, gamma rays, and you can even get weird stuff like auger electrons and such. Okay, so here's what we're going to get into. First, let's get into beta decay, okay? Beta decay occurs typically in uh, one of um, the uh, uh, three types. You have electron capture, and that's when an atom is in an unstable state and it becomes more stable, or at least changes configurations in, in, towards a more stable state, by capturing a really, really low orbital electron. Remember, when you have electrons, they don't really orbit like a planet. They're actually all this probability density stuff. To make it simplistic to think about, just imagine that they're kind of going around the atom. That's not really true, but it's, just, it's good enough for what we're getting into right now. Just imagine them going around the atom. You have them at different distances. Think of them like different orbits. In fact, chemistry people would say orbits. They're wrong, but that's okay. They're chemists. So some of the really low ones have the ability to actually jump into the atom, like K-shell ones and stuff. They jump into the atom itself, and what happens is they get kind of sucked into the atom, and the energy that they give the atom is enough energy to allow the atom to then change one of its protons into a neutron. And this happens whenever you have an atom that has way too many protons, and it's not very structurally secure, and it will suck one of those in there, and then you end up with a um, you end up with a knife that you were using to eat something with earlier, falling and falling and nearing stab nearly uh, nearly yeah, nearly stabbing you in the arm. Apparently that's beta decay. <laughs> um, basically, put you end up with a beta decay. That's electron beta decay. There's also two other types of beta decays. There's um, uh, po beta positive and beta negative. Beta negative decay occurs when a neutron changes to a proton. Neutrons are heavier, they have more mass than a proton, 
And that mass has to go somewhere when you turn to a proton, right? The proton can't be heavier than a proton is. Protons are protons. Big neutron becomes smaller proton. That extra energy, it's got to go somewhere. It has to go. Luckily, as fate would have it, um, it is able to produce a, a little itty bitty particle called a W particle. It's a, called a boson particle. It's a particle that doesn't really it exist, but not for very long. Sometimes people say it doesn't really exist, but it does actually exist, but not not for very long. Um, and the W boson particle flies away from the atom really, really, really fast and has a tremendous amount of energy. It's a, a negative uh, a negative boson particle, negative W boson particle. So what happens is that big proton, that big neutron. Is, is is sitting out there, it's all big and meaty, and it decays into a lighter proton. And that extra energy has become a, uh, it gets kind of pooped off as a W boson particle. And a tiniest fraction of the itiest bittiest bit of time later, that W pro, uh, uh, particle will actually itself decay into an electron, hence the famous beta particle, the electron that we all know of, and an electron antineutrino. It's a neutrino, which is an itty bitty bitty, almost completely massless particle. It's not completely, but it's almost completely massless particle. And it'll be an antimatter version of that particle. And the two of them will go zipping off different directions. All beta decays have the exact same, all beta decays for a particular atom are going to have the particular, are going to have the same beta, they have the same energy. So uh, when, I, when, I, when, when this type of atom decays, with uh, beta decay, it's going to have an exact specific energy every single time it does it. Okay, but the reason that the beta particle flying out gets measured dip with different energies is because that same amount of energy gets sort of randomly distributed between the electron and its anti-neutrino counterpart. Sometimes one gets a lot, sometimes one, the other one gets a lot. And they go shooting off. So that's beta decay. Negative beta decay. Positive beta decay is a little weirder because in that case, a proton turns into a neutron. Now you're saying, wait a minute, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. You said a big neutron, big, big, big neutron, can become tiny electron. I'm sorry, can become tiny proton, right? Well, smaller proton. And that difference in energy had to go somewhere, and it got emitted as a particle. You made this big deal about that. So how can a, a lighter, less massive, therefore less energetic, uh, less energy, uh, proton turn into a bigger, heftier neutron? Something can't come from nothing. Where is that extra energy coming from, you say? And you're right. That's a good point. Uh, what happens is sometimes the atom that you're in has is kind of big and nice and and kind of you know um, proton rich, and the the atom that it could decay to is more tightly packed. It has a tighter binding energy to it. So a lot of that extra energy is being wasted in in, in binding the atom tightly together. It has lower energy state, and as a result of that, um, when the, the a state transfer occurs and the proton becomes a neutron, there's actually enough energy, uh, enough energy is actually given to it from the atom squeezing up and becoming the smaller one that it's allowed to do it. Basically, the, the, you've got to understand that the individual protons exist in an atom, but the atom itself almost could be thought of as its own particle because it's sharing energy all the way around. I mean, there's all this energy sharing going on. So it's kind of like a whole system. It's kind of like, it would be like, if you gave up, if you you are you and your spouse are married, and you give up your job, in order for you two to be more financially solvent, and you might say well, that doesn't make any sense. How can you give up making money and then somehow have more money? But if the act of you giving up your job allows the two of you to move somewhere where your spouse can make four times the amount of money that she was making before or whatever, perhaps that would happen. That's kind of what's happening in this case. And so this still not really energy coming from nothing. It's the atom is kind of becoming a slightly better bound, if you like. This happens in heavy proton-rich um, atoms. And what you, get, what you get out of that is you get an, another W particle emitted, but this time it's a positive W par, uh, boson particle, and that quickly decays into an anti-electron, yes, antimatter, uh, specifically a positron. Positrons are what are emitted. And the positron gets a neutrino as well, but ironically, it gets a normal neutrino. So you can get an anti-electron and a normal neutrino, or you can get an, an electron and an anti-neutrino, one or the other. Okay, so let's let's go over beta decay one more time quickly. Beta decay occurs, um, uh, typically speaking, when a proton turns into a neutron or a neutron turns into a proton. This is allowed to happen um, uh, one of several ways. One of them is electron capture, when an electron gets sucked in the atom, providing the energy to allow a proton to become bigger to a neutron. Or when the atom's configuration after switching is much more energetically favorable, in which case a lower energy proton can become a high energy neutron. 
or when a high energy neutron becomes a proton, in which case the SR plus energy is blasted off as a beta minus particle, which is an electron plus an anti-electron. And of course, when the, um, the, the, when the uh, atom jumps down to a more fav energetically favorable state, it can also produce a positron and a uh, neutrino along with that too. So that's the kind of the rough synopsis of that. So maybe that makes a little bit more sense, maybe, maybe not. Let me know, I'll go into detail about it, each one of them a little bit more if you like. Now, moving away from that, let's get into the other uh, primary form of decay called cluster decay. A cluster decay is when an atom breaks apart to a degree and releases part of itself. Now, let me just start off by saying a nucleus is made up of protons and neutrons, and these are called nucleons. It's just a term that means part of the nucleus, so protons and neutrons are both nucleons. Now, the nucleons... Uh, um, uh, the, nu the nucleons are held together by the strong nuclear force, right? The strong nuclear force is very strong and holds them tightly together. But at the same time, they have an electropositive force. Remember two magnets, you can't put them together. If you flip them, they stick right together. But if you take them and you turn them, they won't stick together. They repel, repel one another. Well, that same effect is happening with protons. Protons are both positively charged. They're positively charged. They do not want to be together. They really want to push apart. But if you get them really close and you're pushing against their force, because they're pushing against they want to go that way, but they can't, you're pushing, pushing them. Get them close enough, the strong nuclear force will bind them together. The force is still pushing them that direction, but the, the force holding them together is strong enough to hold them together. But you stick a neutron in between, the neutron's strong and holds on to this proton, and it's strong and holds on to that proton, so it's holding them on, but, it's, but, but the actual two particles are far enough apart from one another that that uh, repulsive force is starting to really have an effect and they can break apart. So... And atoms that have uh, too many protons in them and too much electropositive force pushing them apart, and they have too many protons or the configuration is just not right, what will happen is sometimes there's a, a probability that a chunk of those protons and neutrons can go blasting off and just kind of shoot off randomly. You know what I mean? It can just be shot off. It's kind of like if you had a tank full of pressure. Okay, the metal in the tank holds that, that, that tank tightly together because metal is really strong. But as you're pumping air into that tank, it's getting more and more pressure. And eventually, some part of the tank, and you don't know what it will be, will rupture and break off. And usually fragments go flying off, right? Okay, sometimes huge fragments, sometimes usually little fragments. And it's kind of like that. Now, the two protons and two neutrons are very stable when they're together. Basically, helium nuclei. And because of that, they're one of the most probabilistic particles to go shooting off. That's why alpha particles are all over the place. But technically speaking, there are other things that go firing off, like uh, 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 carbon-14, for example. Well, carbon-14 is not. I shouldn't have used that one because carbon-14 is usually associated with uh, nuclear uh, with um, um, uh, well, nucleogenesis. But uh, let's say take carbon-12. Okay, carbon-12. That can go flying off sometimes. Various little lithium and stuff, very, very, very very light particles usually will go blasting off sometimes, and they will occur. For example, my experiment, when I took aluminum-27, which is stable aluminum, and I bombarded it with alpha particles, which is kind of like the opposite. Instead of shooting them off, I'm putting, sticking them back in there and forcing them in. Um, when I did that, I created a bunch of different isotopes as a result of it, because what would happen is the alpha particle would be absorbed by the atom, and and, and you'd actually have a secondary cluster decay. But what happened is a, a one proton or two protons or one neutron or two neutrons or some various assortment of the alpha particle would be ejected as a result of my experiment. So technically speaking, on paper, I can write out and show you that I technically should have made aluminum-28, aluminum-29, silicon-28, silicon-29, silicon-30, phosphorus-29, phosphorus-30, phosphorus-31. And of course, aluminum-27 was present. All of those could have been made. All of them had various probabilities. The one, that, uh, the, the one that was the most common, I think, was phosphorus-30. So, uh, just to get an idea, that's, that's what a cluster decay is. Now, cluster decays are heavy ions. They're heavy ion decays, because there are other types of heavy ions that exist. A lot of them slam into us from space all the time. And heavy ions have tremendous amounts of energy, and that's why they're so deadly if they get inside of you. They're like a 45 caliber handgun. When you shoot the 45, it doesn't go very far goes a couple hundred yards and it kind of you know drops pretty quickly like when you shoot a 45 it doesn't go very far before it drops but by god if it hits you before it drops you know it now you shoot a little 22 22 goes a really far distance a little 22 bullet really really fast very very far distance <clears throat> then you you know it if you get by 22 i mean don't get me wrong it's not like you're just going to be wiping it off but you're probably a lot more likely to go running up going hey did you get by 22 oh my god well, it hurts it's bleeding everywhere get the doctor you get hit by a 45 and Maybe you wake up. Maybe you don't. <laughs> you get the idea, right? So 
Uh, that's that's those are primary decays. Things that are not those are not primary decays. Gamma rays are not primary decays. So let's get now into secondary decays. Gamma rays, X rays, and so on. What's the difference between a gamma ray and an X ray? They're both photons, both high energy. A lot of people think X rays are lower energy and that gamma rays are high energy, and they're portrayed this way all the time at schools. Oh my God, it drives me nuts. Gamma rays come from the nucleus of the atom for the most part. This is a simplistic explanation. X-rays come from the shells around the outside of the atom. When electrons around the atom become too energetic and they drop down, they fall closer to the atom, it takes more energy to be away from the atom. Think of a rocket. High up it spins, if it, if the, but if the rocket motor kicks off, if it shuts off, it starts to orbit closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to the planet till it crashes. Electrons drop down orbits all the time. Very commonplace. It's how, it's how fluorescent light bulbs work. But certain types of them, really, really high up electrons dropping a nice far distance, that, that change in energy can be so great that it emits an X-ray. Whenever an electron changes state, it has to emit a photon to change that state. Sometimes these things, like if I took a, um, if I took a, a piece of wire and attached electrodes to both sides and heated up the wire and it glowed nice and red, that glow of red is light coming off that's being shot off because of electrons doing stuff like that. Well, that's sort of why, not exactly, but close enough. Um, Fluorescent lights work that same way too, but if it's a really, really big jump, you can actually, because the bigger the jump, the more energy, the more energy, the shorter the wavelength, the shorter the wavelength, you know, you end up with an x-ray. That's how x-ray machines and doctor's offices work. And so x-rays are when an electron drops state and that, x, that change in energy is great enough to produce an x-ray. Gamma rays occur when protons and neutrons, the nucleons on the inside, when they're really energized from something happening to them. You go over and slap them around a little bit. Basically put when that pro the proton, for example, switched into the neutron and the atom compressed a little bit, you know, the, the, uh, the nucleus may still be in a very excited state, you know what I mean? Or the atom shoots off an alpha particle, some primary decay occurs. Atoms often left <clears throat> in a stable or more stable state than it was before, but more energetic. And what happens is to calm down, a lot of times what it'll do is fire off a gamma ray. And in the case of a nucleus, it's the uh, binding energy that holds all the stuff together, the strong nuclear force. That's what's providing the energy that allows the photon to be created. In the uh, case of the electrons around the outside, it's their state transition. It's electromagnetic force allowing them to you know, drop down. And the change in energy becomes a photon. So that's what you end up with is a photon. Uh, you can also induce some of the stuff, like for example, X-ray emission, uh, X-ray uh, uh, fluorescence occurs when you zap an atom with a with a gamma ray and make it energized, and then it calms down and releases a characteristic X-ray. So maybe that explains a little bit more about how that happens. When you have something like uranium, uranium itself, like uranium two thirty eight, is an alpha decayer. It emits, it's a cluster decay uh, particle. It theoretically could emit stuff, I think, other than alpha particles, but basically always emits alpha particles. But as a result of emitting those alpha particles, it will pop gamma rays and it will also emit x-rays. And its daughter particles that are emitted, some of them are beta emitters, some of them are alpha emitters. Most of them emit gamma and x-rays also kind of variously in various amounts. That's why your, uh, your, your uranium sample should only be emitting alpha particles, right? But it doesn't, it emits all kinds of stuff. And that's the reason why. So maybe this explains a little bit more of this and some more um, detail. Maybe this was just one of the most boring, long-winded videos I've ever made in my entire life. And if you've made it to this far of me droning on for 43 minutes, um, my applause to you. So, and if you have not, sorry, you should have. But anyway, this is, this has been uh, Tom from anti-proton.com. Does that answer anything? Did that help you a little bit? Was that too much? Too little? Did I explain some of it? Um, yeah. If anybody wants to, I can go into more details of like a one of proton switches to a neutron. I can go into uh, the quantum chromodynamic binding energy. I can talk about up, down, um, uh, um, quarks and how they, they actually change from one another and any of that sort of stuff if you want to. Just let me know. That's just more detail than I figured you wanted for this. So, bye-bye.